Hello, everybody. Welcome to a brand new thrilling installment of Club Moffat Talks. I am Chris, the Instruction Librarian. And I'm Joe. I'm also an Instruction Librarian. And I'm Ryan. I am the Associate University Librarian. And today we are joined by Ashley Hurst, the Tutoring and Academic Support Programs. Why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us what you do around here. Sure. So thanks for the, the introduction. I'm, I'm glad I get to hang out with you guys in a different capacity today. I know we work right down the way, but it's it's good to sort of get to- I can wave at you. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, roomies. Okay, so, um, so yeah, I'm Ashley Hurst. I'm the Director of Tutoring and Academic Support Programs on campus. And so um, we, we just help students um, acclimate to college and make sure they have the resources that they need to be successful in a nutshell. I know we can sort of unpack that a little bit later if we want to, but mm -hmm. um, we're just, we're here for them and and they're the, the heartbeat of what all of us do. And so um, I, I love that I get to work with students who are faculty referred, you know, these amazing tutors. I love, I get to work with students who are like, I don't even know what I want to do when I grow up. And I'm like, yes, same. But, um, <laughs> but I love that I get to work with students um, in all different walks of their college careers. So that's what I do. Cool. Fun stuff. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so just to do a little bit of housekeeping, uh, housekeeping here. Um, Anything that you're like reading or watching, just something you might be uh, moderately obsessed with at the moment? Oh, not so, related to work. Oh, okay, not related to work. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I get some articles, some journals. Okay, um, so I am. I, my husband and I are. I'm, I'm not as big of a of a TV show watcher, right? But I do really love the Yellowstone series mm -hmm. of 1883, 1923. Um, I, I just, I, I really enjoy um, the acting. Some of the themes are really hard for me to kind of watch. Sometimes I have to look away in this 1923. I don't know if any of you guys um, watch that, but man, it is, there are some very, very hard um, topics, but um, that's kind of my, my obsession right now is, is 1923. Um, as far as books go, you know, I, I, I really don't do a whole lot of leisurely reading anymore. And a lot of the reading I do when I get a chance to do it is going to be unfortunately related to work. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I like to keep up to date on making sure I'm, I'm, I'm keeping up with best practices in all the different areas that we provide. And so I like to do just some articles and, and just kind of stay up to date um, in some of the journals. But my my best friend is actually um, publishing a book uh, right now. She's in the process um, her name is Erica Bean. She lives in Austin. And I was actually her first editor, first read um, on, on this book. It's called This Must Be the Place. And it is, she has a really great trailer on it on Instagram um, at Erica Bean author. And it is, it is like a travel story. Um, this woman lost her mother and she's just sort of unpacking that. And um, there's a there's theft and burglary involved. Burglary. There's love. There's oh gosh, it's it's an excellent story, um, storyline. I love the character development of it. Um, it was it really just had me. I, I read it in a plane ride. You know, <laughs> I was just kind of like, this is wonderful. So um, once that's published, I'll, I'll I'll make sure to get a copy of it to you guys. So you guys can read it. So I'm very proud of her. But that is kind of my most recent obsession just because it's my best friend and she's publishing a book so I'm very happy for it and thrilled so that's kind of what I've been what I've been up to so um how about you guys what are what are you obsessed with this week <laughs> anyone want to go first you go Chris oh okay so my wife is visiting her uh her parents in East Texas for a week uh just to go over, hang out, do some stuff, uh, get the baby to go visit some other extended family or whatever. And uh, they've been gone for two days and I'm miserable. Uh, for the first time in months last night, I could not fall asleep. Oh no. I just, I just, I, I looked at my phone. It was midnight. I was wide awake. Just like, I, I just, I, I don't, I don't have a good time with things when I when I don't have a schedule when I don't have things that I'm like I'm regimented I need to do this stuff I get really distracted easily if I don't um so I've just been going through my video game backlog um uh, this the stuff that I really really wanted to get to I finally did and 
then from that point I was I kind of got this like malaise or like okay well I've I've played some really really good video games lately and now I don't want to do anything so I opened a book of uh, <laughs> that being uh, Fellowship of the Ring I started kind of reading that a little bit because I'm also I'm reading The Hobbit to my daughter before bed and she doesn't understand what anything is she barely understands words but um mm-hmm. it's just it's just been fun to kind of like read characters and do the voices and try my own take on Gollum but yeah. um as I'm reading that I'm like you know what I don't think I want to read the Lord of the Rings to her at bed because I've been doing Harry Potter I'm going to do Redwall soon uh so I thought okay I'll just I'll I'll read Lord of the Rings for myself and um for the first time ever I'm reading the prologue uh concerning hobbits and um there was a lot of stuff in that prologue <laughs> to to keep in mind that i know is not going to have any bearing whatsoever on the book so um outside of that um my wife and i are watching the last of us um i like it better than the game um we're still watching through the x-files um people keep asking me if i'm going to if i'm watching the canon episodes or the monster of the week stuff and um Almost at the end of season two, and the the episodic monster of the week stuff is so much better than just the normal canon like alien episodes, and um, it's giving me the Twin Peaks itch that I've needed for a really long time. Uh, I I think I love that show, <laughs> um, and it's I usually don't like episodic stuff either, but this one I'm just like I'm just like I I could just watch it forever. I love it. Um, anything else that I'm doing? Oh yeah, I started the the Mandalore. Mandalorian I started the new season of that and I still really could not care less about the extended Star Wars stuff and that's what they're focusing on so um uh, we'll see um yeah I guess that's it I guess that's it. <laughs> that was a lot uh, yeah I, I got a lot of stuff I'm trying to juggle to keep myself occupied and also doing homework as well so like I said, I'm not I'm not regimented like I need to be right now, and it's really affecting me two days later. Wow. Joe, you got anything going on? Uh well, uh I in in my attempt to be reading more, um, I've gotten a book through ILL. I've got the uh the Magician's Land, the third book in the Magician series, and I uh ordered the uh Grimm's manga but it hasn't gotten in yet and I just picked up all of the rest of the Witcher books mm. uh to complete my set uh and I'm hoping to like between now and April's podcast to have actually read all of those things we'll we'll see what happens how so does the thought- second season compare to the book that that it's based on cuz I ask I've me heard- that again Chris the, okay, so the second season that the show was based on, have you watched the show? The, the show Magicians? Yes. The Witcher. The Witcher, yes. Yeah. I've watched that also. Okay. Um, I, I've i heard very differing things about whether or not the second season is faithful to the book that it's based on. Well, even the not. first season wasn't. No, it was, I actually really liked how the first season did the, uh, like how it adapted the short stories and stuff, and it yeah. kind of made it this... But, this really... but there, was, there was stuff in the book, like... They, they they did a thing with the book and the series where stuff that was a secret in the book, they made public knowledge in the series or vice versa. So uh, like, like where uh, specifically in the series without spoiling um, <laughs> for those who haven't watched or whatever and, and want to, uh, there was like a, a big secret involving a king that's like this big secret in the show and in the book they're like yeah here's the deal with that Hmm. so i mean uh yeah it's no the 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 it's by no means a a a scene for scene you know remake going from the book to the tv show even in the first season Hmm. interesting my my entire experience with that series is i played the games I read the first book of short stories and I watched the show and and that's really sure. it but I'm I'm really interested in actually getting into the the books. The Magicians is it just called The Magicians? It's just called The Magicians. Yeah. The this TV the series is 5 seasons. The actual books are only 3 books. 
uh, of, as far as the original. He's gone on and done other stuff. He's done uh, actually some graphic novels and some like in that universe stories, but the original book series is only three books. Oh, interesting. Um, and there's things that I like about the books, but in some ways the series is better. Uh, and and it's it's a weird thing because usually uh, the book will give you more insight into the characters and let you know more about what they're thinking. But but uh, the books have a, a weird POV, a, a weird point of view where it really focuses, especially the first book, on a single character where the TV series lets you see into the lives of multiple different people. Um, and in that way, the show is better. Was this made before or after Game of Thrones? Uh yes okay because that's how that's how the book and the show for that that's also how they kind of turn out as well yeah so that's that's a that's the first thing that comes to mind is just how those are kind of they seem similar yeah oh, interesting ryan honestly nothing uh it's been we've got sacks coming up next week i've been trying to get uh stuff done from um uh class i'm co-teaching I found out that another class I'm going to be an embedded librarian is has made uh, for the next fall, and I haven't updated any of the material in like what five years for it. So I've been going through and trying to update all that stuff. So honestly, no, I just go home and sleep. That's a good use of your time. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so if anyone hasn't noticed yet, for some reason we've uh, we've overhauled like our entire website. Uh, that's any of the uh, instruction that I've been doing this semester, I've been really focusing on the new stuff that's that's available there. Like uh, interlibrary loan is just integrated into our catalog now. Um, you can you can check on like really detailed records for stuff that we don't even have. Uh, it's it's really really uh, easy to use, but it, it has a lot of features that are kind of a little intricate. Yeah. I don't even know why I got off on that tangent, but anyway. <laughs> it's something that's going on. And yeah, maybe yeah. we at some point, maybe this summer we should talk more about it and stuff like that. But today is for our guest and we shouldn't oh, go no. off on tangents. It is indeed, yes. No. Yes. I've, I've spoken too much. <laughs> Please, Ashley, take it away. No, no, no. It's 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 always interesting to hear what people what people watch, what they do when they have, you know, some time uh to themselves so um me oh me um you know a, a lot of times when when you think about okay if you've got you know 20 or, or 30 minutes to to share about something you're passionate about or interested in um as you guys probably saw from my response when you asked me to be a guest it's kind of like oh my gosh <laughs> all the things I love everything <laughs> and I think I've just been that way my whole life it's made it very hard to kind of stay focused on any one thing but I have so many different um so many different ways I spend my time um and and so I'll just kind of unpack a little bit of that and then of course talk a little about what I do here um because I think that's helpful for anybody um who's listening whether they're a member of our campus community or from the outside communities. We actually do, um, as you guys probably do as well, being a public library, get a lot of um, questions about how we can support students who actually aren't MSU students too. So, um, so yeah, here at work, um, you know, we spend a lot of our time um, supporting students through tutoring and, and supplemental instruction. Um, those are our embedded tutors. So they're actually plugged into um, high drop fail withdrawal uh, courses on campus. And um, they take the class again with the students so they can kind of be that integrated peer mentor support for them. Um, and then they host sessions, study sessions outside of class. And so it makes it a little bit more um, accessible to students. Um, it makes those study sessions kind of feel a bit more intimate versus these large lecture hall style based classes, right? Um, and also they know who's gonna be at the session. Sometimes when you're walking into the learning center, you're like, okay, I need a math tutor. Who am I working with? That kind of thing. And they don't know the face that they're gonna meet on the other side. So um, we also work with undecided majors. Um, so for students who, um, 
you know, don't really know their path yet. Scott Feldman and Amanda Nimitz are in our office and they kind of help students find their path. And maybe students have like five different options they're thinking about. They're able to kind of figure out well, what classes can you take right now while you're exploring that aren't going to waste your time and money, you know, that kind of fall into all these different avenues. And so they're a, they're a wealth of knowledge too um, in this row. <laughs> um, we teach the uh, freshman seminars, so the College Connections classes. I know you guys see a lot of our student foot traffic in and out on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Um, and so, you know, this class kind of acclimates students to um, what how can you be a successful college student, but more importantly, how can you be a successful college student here at MSU? Get a, a better look and a, and a more inside scope and view of the different resources that are available on campus. Um, you know, the library talks with our students, the, the dean of students, the um, counseling center. I mean, they get a lot of people who actually write, physically come and talk with them about, here's how you can use um, the support we have on campus. Um, I stay busy mostly doing success coaching appointments. And so um, I do a lot of outreach to students who are um, who are struggling, right? So I'll, I'll pull reports or I'll get these midterm progress reports that we're in the middle of right now, right? Um, of students who um, are maybe earning a D or an F in their class and, and they get an automated email from me that says, hey, you know, here, d depending on what alert reason that their professors are providing, um, here are the different days and times you can come for tutoring, or if you have questions, you can reach out to me. Um, and what I love about this system is that they can respond and it'll come to me. And so that's great. It's just a kind of an open, um, open-ended conversation with students um, all the time, every day. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm constantly chatting with students and I love that, but. Um, Do you find that they're afraid of their professors sometimes? To, oh, yeah. To oh yeah. Oh yeah. And you get the, you get a lot of the first gens, which, which I am too, mm -hmm. who think, um, that office hours are the time that, that professors shouldn't be disturbed. Yeah. They see these are my office hours. And we think as first gens, like, are any of y'all first generation students as well? I've got lots of PhDs in my background. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, you, you get here and you're like, okay, so they put on their syllabus. These are my office hours. Like these are the times that I work on my office work. Don't bug me. So unless professors and faculty are very outright about, hey, these are my office hours, especially if they're working with freshmen. Now, of course, by the time they get to sophomore, junior year, they really should understand what an office hour is and that they are designed for students to come visit and talk about problems and, and concerns or grades or anything like that. But for me, I was kind of like, oh, this is probably the time like I can go see them outside of those hours. Maybe I don't know. They work eight to five. It's, you just never know. Um, and so I think a lot of students, um, they get these alerts from faculty, um, which are very helpful, but sometimes when they reply, they think it's their, it's their faculty member. So they'll say, I'm sorry, Ms. Hurst, I'm not doing well in your class. And I'm like, well, actually you're not in my class. Um, <laughs> it's for professor so-and-so. So sometimes they're, they're just so disconnected from the course that they don't even realize who their professor is. And, um, and yeah, they, there's that sort of, I guess, hierarchical fear of, of the professor at the front of the room, you know, sometimes of course. Um, but, but my nature is always to push them back and, and explain to them the importance of communicating because these professors aren't here without you in the same way that I can't be here without you. Right. So they're here to support you. So make use of those hours, you know, don't, don't go every single and just sit there and stare at them, but like, you know, learn, learn about their interests and, and what they're, you know, if you, if you go to their office and you're asking about a question, you see a picture on the wall that you can relate to relate, you know, because I think those those relationships with faculty are um, one of the most important, um, I guess, not intangibles that a student can take from the college experience, because those are the people writing your recommendation letters. Those are the people who are referring you to be a tutor or an SI or, or a peer educator on campus, you know, so you have to form those relationships. If you're just a student in a seat who never speaks, who doesn't try to engage with the material that they're so passionate about, it's going to be hard for them to connect to you too. You know, so I try to talk to them about the reciprocal relationship between student and professor and what a healthy one looks like, if that makes sense. Yeah. I've got another quick question. Um, yeah. I work with a lot of English faculty mm. and um, some of them have been saying, and this was interesting, an interesting trend that happened this year is that usually um, their upper level classes are very engaged, but their freshman level classes are very disengaged. They said they've seen a flip from that uh, in the uh, last fall. They said all of their their upper level classes were very disengaged, 
but their freshman classes were very excited and very engaged. And so I mean, it might be, it's, it's just anecdotal. So it was just, you know, three different professors I talked to, but I was wondering if that, if you, if you've seen anything like that at all. You know, what's, what's, yeah, what's, what's interesting. So I don't, I don't, I, I used to be um, in the English department as well. Um, so those are all my, my former colleagues, but um, you know, we don't have any upper level courses that, that we teach. Um, sometimes Dr. Bunch mm -hmm. um, will teach for um, another, another department as well. Um, but um, I am, I am sort of matching that anecdotal, um, you know, those anecdotal uh, stories to, to some of my other co uh, colleagues and other across different departments. I'm, I'm hearing the same thing from them. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, I, I think a lot of what we can point to is, is maybe COVID, of course, yeah, and like yeah. right, our new freshmen are excited to kind of just feel a sense of normalcy again, whereas maybe our juniors and seniors are just kind of, they don't have long COVID unless they actually had COVID. But that, that also, I, I heard maybe with, with the with the with the older ones, it might be a fact that a lot of the faculty are like, now we're back to normal. And, sure. and, and, the, and, the, and the kids who have been here through COVID are like, wait, what was before? Was it normal? Right. No. Right. And yeah, and, some of the upper class, the, the upper classmen like that, they would have started college when COVID hit. So that might sure. be, yeah, like you said, that might be and what those, they think is normal. Yeah, those looser deadlines are gone. Those, I I guess, a little bit, a little bit less of a sense of flexibility than there was before. Although I know that some faculty really learned a lot from COVID and actually kept some of those same things in place. And so um, yeah. That's it's interesting. That's an interesting thing to note because I, I'm hearing that as well echoed across campus, not out, even outside of PY. So um, it, ma it makes me wonder, yeah, maybe a TLRC event where we sort of unpack yeah. <laughs> student engagement across, you know. Um, and But if you think about it too, Brian, you know, we're working, we're doing a lot of good work. And this is just me, you know, being under Dr. Garrison in academic affairs, but we're doing a lot of work on the first year experience and even yeah. now edging into the second year experience. So it might make sense that that a lot of those freshmen and, and sophomores, early sophomores really feel engaged on campus. We are cranking a lot of time and money and effort into making sure they do so. Yeah. And so I'm thinking maybe as we sort of transition um, into, you know, what does a junior experience look like? What does a senior experience look like? You know, um, and looking at sort of a, the uh, that model, um, we might even see some more engagement in the future. So that could also be something about that too. But um, so, but one of the, I was I was kind of saying that one of the one of the things I I do. Um, personally, um, in my in my job, besides just like reaching out um, through Navigate, email campaigns, things like that, checking in with students is offering them a one to one experience. Right. So success coaching. Mm -hmm. And I have learned so much from those one on ones with students. Um, imposter syndrome is so real on our yeah. campus. We have so many students who are like, I'm just kind of doing it every day. And I'm hoping one day I just feel like I'm supposed to be here, you know, and um, that's, that's, that's even coming from students who aren't first gen. It's like, okay, I was just kind of told that college is the next step and here I am and I'm just kind of here, right? Um, and it's really an interesting phenomenon because I just, I just got back from a conference in LA um, and it was the conference on the first year experience. And, and a lot of the students who were in attendance, these are student tutors, student success coaches, student SIs, um, they're asking questions at the end of people's presentations, asking about how they're combating imposter syndrome on their campus. And I heard this, this phrase come up all throughout this conference too. And then I get back to campus and it's like, oh my gosh, you know? And like right now where um, my colleague, Dr. Nivens, um, who, who, who runs the um, First Year Mustangs Adventure, she's trying to find peer educators to lead these sort of one hour versions of what we do in College Connections, right? Our one hour seminar. And, we're having to tell faculty, hey, instead of just sending us referrals and us reaching out to these students saying, hey, we've got this position open, you know, can you reach out to the students individually and say, hey, I think you'd be really great in this position? Because students are not identifying with being a kind of person who could run a, a class of freshmen to talk about things like time management and, and study skills and how to be successful in school. Um, and and that what, what we're hearing from faculty um, on first year council and other faculty who are reaching out to students um, and saying it to them like, hey, there's this open position on campus for the fall semester. I think you'd be great at doing it. Students are like, oh, you do? Okay. And then actually consider it. Whereas if we just send a blanket email and say, hey, you've been 
nominated or a faculty member has referred you as they're like, no, that's not me and delete it. It's the wildest thing to me. So I don't know. Um, it might but, have to do with the fact that Generation Z is kind of lacks that common touchstone culture that the previous generations have. They're all very focused on their personal friends, so circle of friends, their own personal wants and needs that they don't identify with larger groups, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. I'm still trying to figure out, I'm still trying to figure out Generation Z, um, you know, um, um, what they need, what motivates them, um, and, and what keeps them engaged. Uh, so when I figure it out, I'll let you know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah. No, it's talking. kind of true because we won't know for another 10, 15 years. Sure. Or and then we'll be in a new, you know, in a new but, generation. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So if you guys could just write in and let us know what <laughs> we need, <laughs> that would be great. Write all of your interests, your dislikes. Yeah. That would exactly. make it easier. Exactly. Um, so, so yeah. And, and we do have a campus full filled with first generation students too. And so mm -hmm. I think yeah. that, um, that could also be sort of like, I don't see myself being a leader on campus where guys, I'm telling you, we have so many administrators on this campus who are first generation. Yeah. Our provost right now is a first generation. So I was telling, I was telling Julie Gaynor, um, the other day after a, a, a leadership meeting, how cool would it be on our on our website to kind of pull some data on how many how many faculty and staff we have on campus who are first gens um, and putting, you know, not that there's, you know, it's just, it's so interesting to have different perspectives, to, to talk with somebody who has a lot of PhDs in their family who grew up at Thanksgiving tables talking about like, I don't know, politics. What do you talk about when you have a, a you know, but, <laughs> but um, you know, versus those of us, I mean, I grew up in the ghetto, you guys, like, people talk about a plastic or a silver spoon in their mouth. Mine, I'm not even sure there was a spoon in my mouth, to be honest. And so um, it's just, it's so interesting to have the different perspectives of mentors on your campus. And so um, I kind of thought that'd be really neat to put a, a, an interesting percentage um, or data points to include on our, on our homepage, just so that students can see themselves here, you know, mm -hmm. Um, we have faculty and staff who, who are also first gen and you can lead on your campus too. So um, I probably thought that would be, I'm passionate about that, I guess, I guess, so to speak. So. Oh, and just to dissuade you. Um, yeah, I was, I didn't live in the rich part of town because my dad was a graduate student. My mom was working two jobs to put him through yeah. college. So yeah, it was, it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah. Yeah. I can, I can certainly appreciate that. I, yeah. Oh, I had to, uh, bartend through through uh, grad school to to make that happen for 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 me today but um so i i feel that but yeah i think um an, another challenge is always i i this is this is my main gig this is what i do this is what fills my bucket i'm i'm so happy i could do this job until i retire and so that's how i kind of know that by the time I was even 30, I was in a role that I could see myself retiring and how lucky am I, right? Um, and that's not to say I, I won't search for another opportunity one day maybe, but man, I'm just, I'm really happy where I am, um, which has then afforded me the ability, like, you know, Chris was talking about earlier with kind of routines and and things like that. Um, it's kind of afforded me the ability to, to, to try other things too. So like on my lunch breaks, um, a couple of days a week, and then um, on Mondays after work, I actually teach aerial yoga downtown um, at Weightless Studio, which is, have you guys heard of it before? Do you know what it is? No, no, I have not. Okay, so imagine like a hammock suspended in the air, and you basically do yoga off the ground. Are you still doing that with your daughter? In other words, yes. So I did it by myself first. Um, it was, it was kind of, I was like, oh my gosh. So one of my, if, if I, if money weren't a thing and I didn't have to like support a family, um, I would run off and be in the circuit. I'd be a carny. I would, I would be in the circuit. <laughs> I would be flying from a trapeze in glitter gowns. Okay. So that is like my dream. And so when I heard that we had an aerial studio in town, I said, I absolutely know that I have to be a part of what they're doing here. And so my instructor was actually a Cirque du Soleil like performer. Um, wow. and she moved off to continue to do that. So you know, Josian, wherever you are, you know, you're doing awesome things. But um, I just kind of thought, wow, I don't really see anybody who looks like me doing this. Um, and so I kind of kept going to classes and I talked with the studio owner who is a cancer survivor and was really wanting something that was a low impact fitness here in Wichita Falls. Um, and she created the studio. I was like, hey, you know, 
um, this is a lot harder than I thought it would be, you know, and I'm just trying to, to figure out how to make this work with my body type and with everything. And she's like, um, okay, well, why don't you get certified to teach it? And you can be one of my instructors. I was like, well, that is not really where I saw that conversation going. <laughs> it worked, obviously, though. It worked, obviously. She said, well, Josian is, is she's moving off to 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 pursue. Um, I think she was mil- her husband was military, so they were moving off um, to pursue their next um, step in life. And she said, I really want you to be the instructor that you needed that day. Like, find some options, find some different. And so I did. I, I got certified to teach aerial yoga, and I've been researching different options, you know, on you know, studying back up on A and P and the muscle groups and figuring out, you know, if you have this kind of pain or if you're pregnant or if you're whatever, like how can you still practice? So that's been a really fun new kind of hobby. This is my third year, um, to, to do it. And, um, so it's, it's not cardio, you know, your heart rate doesn't go crazy, um, but you still get a great workout and, and, and stretching and strengthening. And it's great for some of our local LPCs actually refer their clients um, to a studio like Weightless, just because the end of my class, you get two full songs, what's in called Shavasana, and you're wrapped in this cocoon of a hammock. It is the coolest thing. And you can just work on your breath and meditate or do whatever you do when you have quiet moments to yourself. And that's how I end every single class. And so I'm like, man, this would be cool to do on my lunch break. So I started doing it from 12 to one on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Cause I'm like, I can't think of a better way to spend my lunch break. You know, So it's been so much fun. Um, we also have like bungee where you're harnessed in and you go flying off um, and it pulls you back like the resistance band kind of thing, but in yeah, the air gotcha. and um, you know, rebounding fitness and, and all sorts of things. So it, that's been a lot of fun. Um and I, anytime I can make a hobby into something paid, I'm going to do that um, <laughs> because that's just who I am uh, as a as a person. Um, oh, that's my boss calling me, but she's pretty cool. Um, so um, anyway, I, I think that I think that that's been fun, but I, I've been able to kind of fold it in to my to find some me time in my day, but also get paid to do it, and also it's something that I enjoy. So I'm like, I consider that a win. Um. And then I do, I own a small business, uh, photography and videography. So I do like weddings and, um, senior photo, all sorts of things, um, here and there. And of course, in the last couple of years, I've really just tucked back on it so much. I mean, I might do the occasional destination wedding and just kind of get a trip out of it and kill two birds with one stone and, and do a wedding and get a trip out of it. But, um, but I've really kind of switched over in, into the world I'm ordained. And so I actually like, you know, we'll, we'll facilitate. I don't even know what the verb is anymore, but, um, a, a wedding now. So it's a little bit more low key and, and not as time consuming now that I have a kiddo, but, um, that's been also a fun sort of Avenue, um, is the world of photography and videography. So, um, so that's, so you mean I need to darken your doorstep whenever we need to get other pictures and stuff done for our yes. father, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. You bet. Um, and you'll see, it's so funny. You'll see a lot of photographers on our campus all the time um, doing pictures because we have such a beautiful campus. So it, it makes it, it makes it really easy. But, um, and then uh, I saw y'all's podcast with, uh, with Kim Gordon. I know her through theater, um, the theater world. So I'm on the backdoor theater improv troupe and I've done a couple different shows around town. So um, that's just kind of one of my outlets and a way to volunteer, you know, um, which is fun. And then one of my other kind of bigger, um, time consuming, uh, projects is, um, leadership, which falls. And so that is a wonderful program, um, to get it's, it's based a lot rooted in philanthropy. So we, we do a lot around the community to try to figure out, okay, what are the nonprofits in the area? Where can you see yourself serving? If you want to be on a board or a task force or, or a committee, um, around town, so we can kind of pair our alumni with, other boards and, and, and areas of interest, you know, are you interested in working with pets or whatever? So my part of that um, is working with the youth. So every spring, every two weeks, I take 30 students, 10 from each um, school, and um, we go around and volunteer. I show them different, you know, we work with students who have special needs. We work with, um, you know, the elderly community. We, I kind of have them find, you know, what are, what are you passionate about? Where do you want to serve? Um, and what does our community need? And so 
Um, our adult class does like a project at the end, a betterment project or, or a fundraiser for a charity. And so it's a really great program. Um, but that's another area that I like to volunteer and, and spend my time. So it's a lot of time, but it's kind of like, you know what, you have to keep pouring into yourself, I think, and, and being a part of the community that you live in. And so that way you can, which I actually don't even live in this community, I live in holiday, but here we are. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I, we'll, I'm, I'm we'll really pretend passionate. that counts. Yeah, it counts. It's, it's, yeah. it's close enough. Right. right. So, um, but yeah, I just think it's, it's been a challenge to try to find that balance between, okay, what do we do at work? What do we do at home? And also making it, you know, my family's involved in a lot of those things with me. So it kind of becomes a family outing when we go to leadership events or we go to, you know, the theater together. Um, and I kind of help them with their archivals. And so I'll take video for the theater um, and, and record their plays for them so that they have it for archives. But I can take my whole family with me and we can make it a family affair. So it's not time away from them. So I really have a habit of taking things I'm interested in either finding a way to monetize them so I can make money from doing them. Or if I want to volunteer for them, how can I bring my family along? So it's like a family outing too. So anyway, I try to be very efficient, but it doesn't always work, I guess. So anyway. So yeah. So you're a real Renaissance woman is what you're telling me. You do I guess, everything. I guess, I guess that's what you can call me. I, what is it? The jack of all trades, king of none. That's kind of me. But uh, in library me. world, it's a, uh... You wear many hats. Yes. I've heard that in every single institution I've ever stepped foot in. Yeah. And I like it that way, I think. Mm -hmm. So anecdotally, um, I just thought of this as well. Um, I've noticed a, a pretty good amount of students coming in and asking if we do like um, editing and, and writing to uh, tutorship and, and just stuff like that. And I can't even imagine at this point how many people I've had to say, okay, go across the walkway over there and you'll be good. Have you noticed an influx of students who are specifically request or requesting tutoring and, and other kind of instructional help? So it's it's pretty, so I thought that when we made the move over to the library um, to, to be work roomies with you guys <laughs> in 2020, it was in the summer of 2020, I kind of thought I would see an immediate uptick um, in the number of sessions that we're offering, but you know, something happened in 2020, I guess it made it kind of hard to do that. Um, but, uh, but honestly, it's, it's kind of stayed the same. Um, but I do think that as we, as we stay, as we kind of keep, you know, and as we educate students, what does the library do? And, and what do we do? And I know we try to do workshops together, just to, you know, inform students about the difference between the different services and when, when can you refer where, um, but as far as writing support goes, gosh, yeah, our students are always looking for um, at various points in their drafts, which is what we want um, to to come and, and work with us. Now, a lot of them do use the term editing, Chris, and I I kind of cringe a little bit because I'm like, oh, it's not really what any of us do. Um, but um, we do have, uh, as part of the grad school, they do have somebody, um, her name is Anna LaRue Phillips, and she does... Um, she works with graduate students on their writing, but then she's also a freelance editor. So if they are looking for someone, if their professors are requiring that they have an editor look at their work, you know, as part of a paid service, then she does provide that as well, kind of a line by line sort of thing. Um, so I haven't really noticed an uptick. It's it's pretty much stayed the same, um, but maybe during different parts of the semester, like now that we're doing the term progress reporting, they're starting to come in earlier than just flooding in at the very end, right? So that has been really great um, to have them spread out a little bit more so that our tutoring staff isn't just buckled down and, and bottlenecking these waiting times. Um, the earlier that students can come in, obviously the better. Um, so that way they can make sure they get in and they're not all coming in April, you know, <laughs> on the yeah. project that's been due this whole time. Right. So Well, it also goes back to the first thing you're saying too, is because a lot of times the professor would love it if the, if, if the student came in with an early draft to show them for something. I mean, yes. and the students think, oh, that's not allowed. Absolutely, it's allowed. You, yeah, they absolutely. want you to. They're they begging want you, to. you to come in. It's in their syllabi, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's the it's the lead a horse to water all day long, right? Yeah. And and um, and, the, and the students who are coming in, it's they're not the students who I would argue that actually need it. I'm not getting a whole lot of students who. Mm. Um, are maybe on probation or maybe at risk of not earning a 2.0. It's a lot of our highly motivated students who know that 
help seeking behavior is the sign of a smart and successful student. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, that stigma is kind of gone for them. Thank goodness. Cause we really try to break that down and during orientation and, and before from the first moment they step on campus that it's okay to ask for help. And that's why we are here. We all have jobs in the help business. So, right. I'm I mean, amazed how many times I've tell, had to tell people, hi, can you help me? And I'm like, yes, that's what they pay me for. Yes. That is what I do. <laughs> we should all wear buttons that are like, like Walmart, like ask me how I can help. No, I'm just kidding. But, but seriously. Um, and I, but they I always think- apologize. They're like, I'm sorry. I have to ask you for help. I'm like, that's I, I wait for people to ask me for help. Thank God, some of the, someone came in finally. Well, and you know that when they were doing when we were doing the remodel for the library, I don't know if really a lot of students are aware that all of the yellow what, desks, I guess, is what we would call them. All the yellow um, are are areas for help. So, yeah. like our kiosks are yellow, the surf desk, all the info, all the info desks, and and um, the former tech help area and stuff. All of that is yellow. As you say that, Chris looks outside to see if anyone needs help. Yeah, right. <laughs> Who's helping? No, but um, and 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 we did that for them as a kind yeah. of like wayfinding to find like, okay, if you need help, you can come to one of these yellow areas and we can help you. And that'd be really cool if the university could just like adopt it campus wide, so that students weren't so confused about what that means or that it even is a thing. You know yeah. that these are the spaces that are like for you to help. So sometimes marking those out can be well the thing and again the thing is though in the modern day university system there are so many programs to help the students it's oh it's oh really is overwhelming i mean yeah. um there's so many ways that the, so many different ways they can get help there's so many different ways that they have services that they have no idea that they have these services or these things available to them right and it's 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 honestly it's kind of overwhelming unfortunately to some sure. extent sure it's like when you hear from all all ears yeah, and yeah. all areas, like help, 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 help. It's almost like almost disengaging, maybe. So well, I remember I remember several years ago, one of uh, my boss at the time, who has I'm in the position now that she was in, she came and goes, Ryan, why are we no one showing up to workshops at the library this week? I go, come with me. And I took her to our front bulletin board and I go, look at all the different workshops that are going on around mm-hmm. campus this week. Yeah. <clears throat> And on that note, actually, you want to talk a little bit about um, our workshop that we're going to be having next month? Sure. Um, so every, uh, is it every spring, Chris? It's that every, so far, it's been the 3rd of March at 3 p.m. Yes. This will be the third year that we're doing it. Yes. And so um, I was out of town this year, boo me, um, on, on 3 3 at 3, but but we're maybe looking at 4 4 at 4, maybe. Yes. Um, and <laughs> so uh, we'd like to do a Meet at Moffitt workshop um, where we can just sort of talk about the different resources that we have. I love the time of year, too, just because it's maybe not as, as busy of a time for workshops. A lot of times workshops are really sort of... Um, proactive on the front end of the campus, whereas we're not necessarily being reactive. We're just kind of like, hey, don't forget, you know, as you're edging into finals and and getting ready, some of you guys are going to be graduating. So, you know, how can you be using this space um, to to make use of your of your study time? You know, what's here? What do we do? And I'm sure you'll want to kind of talk about um, the website and and how it, you know, getting as many ears as we can um, to listen about what kind of services that the library offers to students um, and who's all here and what we do. So hopefully that'll, that'll be um, on our listeners radar and um, all of our Instagrams too shortly. Cause I guess here we are in March. So yeah, we're, we're um, getting up on it and uh, yeah, February just flew by and uh-huh. I'm kind of, I'm kind of glad that it worked out so that we can get a little extra time to, to work on it yeah. this year, I think just because in the past, it's always been like that, where March just kind of sneaks up on us. And the last, yeah. well, the first time we tried it, um, it was following that really massive uh, snowstorm that we had. Yeah, I think last year it was something similar, or at the very least, our planning, um, or the days that we were planning on meeting for it, uh, that also got stormed in or something. Yeah. Like we've we've been. <laughs> shockingly unlucky every single time we try to plan this, this thing well out. it just tells you that march is early march is not a good time to do it you may be no, thinking no. to switch to april yeah maybe that's <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll see how it turns time. out now yeah absolutely yeah so I'll, I'll look forward to that. are we doing the atrium oh yeah of course okay yeah. cool. whoever's there we just kick them out who cares yeah kick them out do a little... get all c's meeting again yeah yeah <laughs> exactly 
But yeah, that's you don't have any burgers and beer. Well, it'll be May for burgers and beer. But again, if you kick, it, if you kick the faculty out for burgers and beer, they will cut you. No, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Yeah. <sighs> Ashley, I had a, a question about the uh, aerial yoga. <laughs> okay. uh, well, be, <laughs> aerial. Uh, aerial. Universal yes. sign. Yes, yes the universal uh, uh, sign. Well, because you you talked you you mentioned that you didn't really see people that looked like you there, and I have a question about it because in my head, for someone to be flipping their body around suspended <laughs> above the floor, they probably need to be a small ethereal type person, whereas I am large and old and stiff and ungainly and, and weigh a million pounds. So I, I wondered if you could talk about like limitations or accessibility. That is a wonderful point. So um, if you're going to be using the hammock, because it's a prop, right? So we also do things on the ground using the hammock like you would a bolster or a block in your yoga practice. Um, we say 300 pounds would be like if you're going to be doing a high hammock, flipping back upside down, you know, and and it's wonderful for your spine, like for your, oh, I have no back pain anymore. It's gone. It's wonderful. Um, but we also have low hammock options. So on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights, Jess teaches a hammock, a hammock class that's restorative. So it's very low to the ground. And so you can edge out of that, um, of the weight limitation for that. Um, the main reason is that our, our rigging points are set for 1000 pounds of dynamic force because we're doing, sometimes we spin and things like that. If it's a stationary class, you can get out of the weight limit or you don't have to ever get in the hammock at all. You can just use it as a prop from the ground. Oh. And so there are options for everyone. You can be in a wheelchair, you can be, um, and I can have, I can have options for, for anyone. So it just might look a little bit different, but everybody looks different anyway. Um, oh. I just mean, you know, when you think of the traditional sort of yogi, you think of like tall, long, lean, I don't know. Um, and so here I was like, you know, 200 pounds, like I am never going to be able to do that. And I did and I do, and it's great. Um, but I just think for the average, you know, woman, it's like, um, you know, I, I, it's like imposter or like, there's this mental block. Like I'm not going to flip upside down. People are afraid of being upside down. I get it. Um, but it is wonderful for the hips, for the spine. Um, because my, my chiropractor actually comes to, to our studio. So, um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's wonderful for the body in, in all different kinds of ways, but yes, it looks different um, depending on what kind of accommodations you might need or what options that you're, that you're looking at doing, but anybody can do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. You've mentioned Thank something you. a few times that I kind of want to address just very briefly. Sure. Um, and this oh, is, yeah. this is for you listeners. Um, if, for the audio people, I'm pointing directly at you. Um, <laughs> I was like, wait, who if, are you pointing to? <laughs> the only people the only people who I believe are truly like imposters or should feel like imposters are the ones who don't. The oh. ones who aren't of that mindset where they're I'm gonna just, write yeah, that yeah, down, yeah, Chris. I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm perfect at what I do. I'm a professional. I know exactly what I'm doing. No, you don't. We're, no. we're all learning. We're all trying to do our best. And the point where you stop trying and stop acknowledging that there's a way to improve upon that's when you've stagnated that's when you truly are an imposter in my opinion exactly and and i think i like to use the um, analogy of gas because a lot of our students are like what is the one thing you hate paying for the most and a lot of times that they're just gas because it's an intangible it's like oh gosh you know i put it in my car and i get it to go places and i want to have my car because maybe i don't feel like walking all the time but I'm like, okay, you wouldn't just pull up to the pump and pay for your gas and then leave, right? Unless you were paying it forward, maybe, sure. Otherwise, you're going to pump your gas before you leave. And it's that idea that you, you've paid for this. You've paid for these services. They're included in your tuition fees. Yeah. Don't just drive by us. Don't leave. Don't, if you have questions or even if you don't, that's why I love homework help, um, which we moved. I don't know if you guys know that we moved it from um, sort of the, the um, that east corner um, of the library now it's embedded in the learning center and our, our learning mm -hmm. center tutors are the ones circulating that's why i love homework help because it's non-committal like even if i don't have a question yet i can still come and be near the tutors in case i have a quick question and so it's kind of for the less committal kind of students who are like i don't really want to set up 
a time out of my day to come there for an hour and, and, and talk to somebody. Um, but I can go sit in the homework help lounge and work on my homework. And then if I have a question, I can just sort of raise my hand and pop over, you know, and it's not like a sign in, sit down and talk with a tutor right then and there. So they're identified to sort of help with patterns if they're working in that area. So, um, but yeah, that's good. I, I, that's good word. I should write that down. What did you say? The only imposter is those who don't or who don't think of themselves that way. Yeah. Do what? <laughs> the, the thing that you <laughs> no, said. I, 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 I switched to a different track already. No, what I was uh -huh. thinking was when, when you mentioned going, like moving all the homework help over here, I've noticed a huge increase in traffic mm -hmm. just just with with students hanging out over there and, and getting their uh, tutoring done or just doing yeah. their homework it's like it's like tripled at the very least at all times of the day and i i really like and i think it's going to improve stuff too because i see so many people go over there and they see everything empty over there earlier when 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 it wasn't over there and they turn around and leave yeah because it, but i think the fact that you do now have i'm looking outside my window and there's tons of people sitting out on tables doing various things i think that's a lot more welcoming to a lot of people it's great and dr bunch was was a really big mastermind of that because we were trying to find a way ourselves to be more efficient with our resources with our funding you know and so just having the learning center tutors instead of staffing two completely different spaces i think this has worked better for everybody so i'm really excited about that move Oh, and by Ashley, we can give you the transcript, so you'll know exactly what what oh, uh, what Chris. No, said. I said something to the effect of the <laughs> people who don't, people who think they're not Im imposters, are the ones in in that area. Who probably are. <laughs> yeah. No, I immediately thought of a, a bit from "It's Always Sunny," where uh, "It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia," where uh, Frank, played by Dennis Reynolds, gives this like amazing motivational speech to the gang and uh someone says yeah where did you where did you hear that one from frank and he just immediately goes huh <laughs> and then he just like he just it, it's just a different track altogether yeah that happens from time to time yeah worries like i will i will readily admit that i feel like an imposter at all hours of the day I think it's academia too. I think it does it to a yeah. lot of us, you know, just the nature yeah. of the institution where we work. But I think MSU does a really good job of. Yeah, me too. I, it seems it seems like a, a lot of the staff here, a lot of the faculty are, are really approachable. Um, the For anyone who does worry, like we mentioned before, that if you think that your professor's uh, office hours mean that uh, this is where they're going on a break and uh, um allowing the stress from teaching you to kind of like cool off of their body no they're <laughs> they're here this is this is their job um i i'm reminded of this uh this letterman bit when uh twin peaks was about to get canceled and david lynch said something about uh like please write to bob Iger or whoever it was over at uh nbc or cbs or whatever and, and tell them to air the last of the show and uh letterman goes yeah i'm gonna give you i'm gonna show their address here on the screen i love bothering these corporate weasels <laughs> maybe i'm not i'm not saying the faculty are weasels by any means but it, i'll just say go this. by and bother them a lot of the faculty are really lonely sometimes i mean i hate to say it but they are. <laughs> there was a there was a time when i first got here because we were talking about getting like a book club kind of thing going and it actually kind of morphed into this like this is what at the end of the day, we were we had this idea for like this, well, basically this, like a like a sit down and almost like a fireside chat kind of thing. Yeah. And um, you would be so shocked at how many professors were like, I would love for you to come by and sit down and, and we could discuss ideas for uh, for how we can build this thing. And um, yeah, like we had people who were coming all the way across campus here to talk to us about it. And wow. That's yeah, awesome. they just they just really wanted to give their ideas to us, and and that was well. Okay, what they really wanted to do was make it part of their um, uh, part of their the requirements to get to uh to get tenure is what they wanted. Oh, no. uh, yes, they had they had a few of those. I'm not I'm not mentioning them. I'm not putting anyone on blast. But that, that was also part of it. However. They are here for you, and they very much enjoy. Uh, oh, they are. Uh, like, uh, but my point was going to be, I, I know professors who just have students come in and play chess with them for for like twenty minutes, and that's it. That's awesome. 
We have chess boards here in the library if you'd like to come and check one out and play with your professor <laughs> yeah. and invite Chains him over here. Fun. There you go. Yeah. There you go. We do really quick just on the professor note and inviting them over here. We are thinking about bringing back. So pre-COVID, um, when, when the writing center was still over in PY and, and the tutoring center was in McCullough, um, we had some faculty, primarily from the English department, because they're who I knew the best at the time, um, who would actually do hold an office hour in the writing center. And it was seriously one of the best things we did. I'm, I'm thinking of Dr. Conan um, off the top of my head, just because she did a lot of writing center work at OSU. And so when she came back to actually work for MSU, she was a grad student here before that. Um, and she started in the writing center with me and we were colleagues at the time. It was so amazing to see her come back. She was working with students one-on-one -on -one in the writing center. The other tutors were listening in um, and, and listening to how they were working with students and talking to them about writing. So they were learning from the faculty. The faculty were learning from them. It was incredible. So, I, and I have seen some faculty um, from the math department as well, um, just kind of using one of our tables to come talk to their students and get outside of their office. And I really wanna invite them to come back um, just because I love the traffic in the area. And I also yeah. think when it's when it's productive like that and students are listening to faculty from their colleges talking with other students, as long as it's nothing personal, you know, talking about like an assignment or something, they're learning from that. It's incredible. So um, I would love to bring that back. So just as a little, little nudge to any faculty listeners. <laughs> I'd like to see that too. That'd, that'd be great. It's, it's amazing just to see the community out, out here. It's awesome. Oh, yeah. Uh, we are approaching the hour mark. Um, is there anything else you might want to add? Anything you want to maybe tell our uh, listeners about that's coming up? So first, the listeners were here in the camera, and now they're back here behind you gesturing <laughs> to your... <laughs> they <just> are, <laughs> um, they're everywhere. They're, they're everywhere. They're surrounding. They're in the air. They're, you know... That's right. Of course. It, they bind us around. together. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, anytime I have that option to just kind of give my little, my little, tip, my hat tipper, um, is just to wrap back around to the concept that, or this idea that, um, when you're talking about MSU faculty and staff, you know, we, we are, we understand that, that without you is, there is no we. And so I think that, um, just want to take another opportunity to encourage students just to come by and see us. Um, I hope that you guys doing these podcasts and inviting guests from campus makes us all feel a bit more human and approachable. Um, and when you get into our offices and see the weird things that we have, I mean, I have a giant shrine to my child behind me, you know, it's like <laughs> you, you see <laughs> us and you realize like, <laughs> yeah, and books and, 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 or comic books or whatever it is you can look at and point to and find those, those commonalities um, in whoever you're talking to in, the, in their office and, and you know, pop back and, and make use of our resources um, as well as come see our Made at Moffitt workshop in on April 4th. <laughs> That's what I'll take my, my last little plug to say. Always ask for help. It's not a sign of a weak student. It's actually quite the opposite. It's a sign of a very um, motivated student um, and, and come visit us in the library. And uh, as you said before, you guys have already paid for these services. Take advantage of them. There's the university wants you to succeed. They, they have they have a vested interest in making sure that you graduate. Take advantage of that. Yep. Ditto. Claps, snaps, all the things. Yes. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh Joe, was there anything going on in the community right now that you wanted to mention? There there is. I, I have the list, uh, but I also <laughs> did want to say. For some reason this month, there are a lot of movies coming out that I'm actually really interested in. Okay. Uh, uh, Operation Fortune, Scream 6, Shazam, the new John Wick, the Dungeons and Dragons movie. It seems like it's going to be a good month to go to the theater. But in addition to that, uh, the Wichita Falls Public Library has story time on Thursday mornings at 1030. Uh, guest teaching artist Daniel Juarez will conduct cross-hatching workshops at the WFMA from 2 to 4 on two Saturdays, March 18th and March 25th. Those workshops are free with materials provided. Uh, Casting Crowns, the Healer Tour, will be at K. Yeager Coliseum on March 24th. Backdoor Theater will be having an evening of improv on March 25th. 
the public library is hosting Maker Monday for children 6 to 11 on March 27th. Uh, and Speed Dating Tonight, a comic opera by Michael Ching, will be presented in Aiken Auditorium March 31st and April 1st. And for more information about those and other activities, you can check out the events section of the MSU Texas homepage and the calendar at discoverwichitafalls.com slash events. And if you have anything that you want us to announce, just drop us an email at library at msutexas.edu. That's it. All right. Very good. Awesome. awesome. Uh, and with that, I'm going to say that, um, that that'll do it for us. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, we will talk to you all next time. Thank you all so much. Thank Thanks. you for joining us, Ashley. You're welcome. And for our listeners, uh, have a good one. Have a good one.